we're happy with that. I'll, I'll introduce the panel. I'll um, sit down now, I think. So, um, Sarah, I, I, I already sort of briefly introduced. Um, just to say, though, that the, the Wiltshire Wildlife Trust is, is unusual in, in the Wildlife Trust movement, in that, um, like some of them, it farms itself. As an organisation, it produces food um, through its own livestock operations. Um, but also it has a strong focus on sustainability, um, which, which is unusual in the movement. And I know um, that, that Sarah's work in the Trust for, for, for over five years reflects a lot of that. I know that Sarah worked previously on the Compost Ambassador Programme, which was an, an exemplar of, of engaging people in sustainable behaviour. Cracking programme with a good rep, so not surprised she got the local food job. Um, so that, that, that's Sarah. And the, the Wiltshire Wildlife Trust. Jerry Hannon um, is um, here representing SCAN and, and also Transition Swindon. Um, he's served, served for, for, for quite a long time in, in the town, um, head of Thames Downs Community Recreation Department, a local director of um, health promotion, um, and at that time he was also on the UK Public Health Association with, with Tim. Um, so I suspect that's how we, we collared him for tonight, was, was through Jerry. Um, more recently, Jerry's working for the, um, the, the cycling charity Sustrans, um, and he's campaigned long recently on sustainability issues, particularly around food and transport. So um, Jerry's a, a, a scan campa campaigner. Um, Lorraine Stanton is from Bowley Farm near B Bassett. Um, and since you moved in in December 2000, so your website tells me, um, yourself and Mark, you developed a local, uh, uh, a variety of local animal and poultry based produce. Um, but what particularly impressed me was um, the additional work you've, on top of, on, you've done on top of that to create a food hub, providing a variety of local produce with a variety of local suppliers from within a 10 mile radius, which just rings so many bells and it's just you know, what we need entrepreneurs to be doing, it was just, so um, I thought that was great. I also remember eating your produce at the Apple Day, which I thought was great, so um, very pleased to have Lorraine here, and Tim, you've met. So this is your panel for the next session. Um, open it up, if, if questions can come through me, um, I'll, I'll fill them out to the panel. We'll just sort of go along and let people, so who wants to go first? I'll let the tumbleweed run across the table. <laughs> God, you all knew this was coming. <laughs> Andy. But I ask, I ask one that's quite physical. I'm not sure you know, how many people will be able to answer it. But Tim, you mentioned towards the end of your talk um, about basically being kicked out by Lansley because he wanted to only listen to, to big business. That kind of fits you know, my prejudices quite well. I, I think that um, we have such a crap diet in this country because um, the politicians have got all the evidence in front of them. They know we've got a really crap diet, but they're so in, in bed with big business and big business just want to keep feeding us a crap diet. Is that right? Um, if, if so, how do we change it? Or if it's wrong, then what, why, why do we have such a crap diet? Mm -hmm. Well, let's start with Tim and come along this way. I'm just busy writing Big Business Wants to Fit Feed Us a Crap Diet. I mean, at one level, I know why you're saying that. Uh, but there are very contradictory pressures. I mean, I'm no fan of PepsiCo. I'm no fan of Walmart. I'm no fan of Nestle. For all sorts of health reasons. These are not my favourite companies. But if I look at what they are doing about basically panicking about climate change, you wouldn't believe it. Uh, PepsiCo, which basically is self sugary water, which is the most stupid product, the single best thing that PepsiCo could do would be to go up in business. <laughs> that would be an advance for public health. Okay. Yet what it is doing is actually reducing its water footprint and its carbon footprint in the UK and Northern Europe as an experiment to see whether it can be rolled out around the world. Given you know, these cola companies dominate taste, you know, I live in London and we're now having the Olympics London. It's actually not Pepsi, it's Coca-Cola. You can do nothing about it at all. That is what the Olympics are. They are 
McDonald's, Nike, Coca-Cola, hit time, and that's it. If you want the Olympics, that's what you get. You can't go into the Olympic stadiums carrying water. You can't take a pack. You can't take a, a pack lunch. You have to buy what is there. Now, wow. Okay, so I don't like these companies. But they are now facing a very contradictory world where they're looking at it and saying, we're not going to supply that infection unless we start addressing ecosystems. What they're doing, I think, is responding to some of them. So you said big business wants to feed us a crap diet. I think it's now big business is actually very contradictory. It's very troubled. And they are particularly troubled on the health front, not the eco-health front, but on the human health front, by being blamed for obesity. And that's a very interesting situation. It's one that drives Jeff and me, and I think about Jerry too, and anyone in public health, slightly mad that the public health world is so weak and not taking on these companies and bowing down to them. Actually, we've got to tame them. And that sounds, what on earth can a bunch of loonies in Lower Shore farm? That's where we are. <laughs> <laughs> Looney's bit I do know, but I sometimes wonder where we are. Uh, what can we do about it? Well, actually, that's the history of public health. It's people daring to take on vested interest. That is actually the history of public health. It's taking on vested interest to say health has to come first. And, and convincing the mass of the population, or enough of them, and enough people in places of power to do that. But that was the old model. What we're not sure in the world of Twitter and Facebook and democracy through the internet, whether the politicians really are the people who can deliver that change. It's a moot point. I actually think they are. They are important, actually. In our book, Jeff and I wrote a great length about the democratic transition. Um, it's gone wrong. It's gone messy. It's got distorted. But it was always thus, actually. If you look at the, the rise of, let's say, English democracy, it's actually an 800-year-old history. Actually, it doesn't happen instantly. I think we're on the back foot at the moment, but we'll come on to the front foot. So, clearly we're eating a crap diet, but we're also eating better than we've ever eaten before. It's very contradictory. So I'm not sure I agree. I'm very politely saying I'm not sure I agree. It's just a crap diet. We eat crap, but also some good stuff. And where that's what we don't know. For me, that's an issue about trying to define what a sustainable diet is. What is a good diet? Yeah? I'm not quite sure, actually. We're getting a bit clearer. Do any of the other panel members have a view on that? I mean, does that make sense to you? I don't know. I can go on for hours about this, but I won't. I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, um, in the, the the slant of your your question, which is um, big business are feeding us a crap diet, and I'm really passionate about encouraging each one of us to take responsibility. Um, if everybody decided that they just did not want to buy cola anymore, then cola would stop producing cola immediately. Um, there are implications for that, as we've heard Tim Tim saying. And, you know that are that are on you know the economic side of things and, and the, you know who they employ and what other things they do and contribute to. But I'm really clear that um, the power is with the consumer, and I think that we have been spoon fed and nanny stated for so long that we've forgotten we are the ones who have the power. And we're the ones who decide how we spend our money. Nobody else decides that, unless you know, the tax is a, a different story. But you go home with money in your pocket, whether that's a benefit or something you've earned or your, hard, your, your savings, and you decide whether you buy meat or vegetables, you decide whether it's got big food miles on it, you decide whether it's from a big company or a local store, you decide. And that's my, that's my answer to... So that's Great. Well, I've picked up Tim's point about it's, it's quite ambiguous in a way because um, a bit of me finds myself nodding with you, but then um, 
I also think that uh, democracy has probably been so hollowed out these days by the power of the conglomerates and TV so riddled with advertising that the ability to make these decisions a bit more cleanly is the, the, the water is quite muddy these days. I um, I sit at home and, uh, with my 15 year old boy and has anybody seen this program Man V Food? <laughs> Any, anybody seen it? <laughs> right, well, I'm not, I'm not regular. Tell us it. Tell us it. Um, this, should big, be it. this big fat B A S T A R D <laughs> it's, runs, a, runs a half hour program and it seems to be wall to wall. Nobody else seen this except me. It's the most obscene program I think I've ever seen. This big fat boy. Except he's pro he's proportionately big. He's not gross. The program is about finding the biggest meal in town and gorging. My 15-year-old boy um, watches it three of these programs in a row, and I'm sitting there swearing about this, that, and the other, <laughs> starving people in Africa, blah blah blah. Just so, and, and my son's mid. They're broad middle class, son of the director of health promotion, blah 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 blah. So the water is incredibly muddy about um, decision making in the environment. So, so when I think about um, the future, Andy, um, given the power of the conglomerates, uh, and us trying to empower ourselves, uh, and because I don't think the revolution is tomorrow anymore, um, I think the future is probably. Us doing bits, you know, we, we have to do bits. We can't just sit there. We've got to do bits. So programs like this and all that we want to do is what we've got to do, as well as then backing the likes of <coughs> Jeff and uh, Tim when they go to government committees in good faith and you know take a pasting from the trouble sack. and take a pasting from <laughs> the trouble. But somebody sort of got to do it. I mean, we we do the same. Look, we yeah, climate action network regularly is with the local authority, and it's it's a hard task. And, and we've got to do it. Somebody's got to do it. But actually, we've also got to do real stuff as well. Sorry, not bits of culture. <laughs> <laughs> Making a nice tree. Yeah. Dan, I agree. I think, like you were saying about the choice, I do agree in the power of the consumer, but I think some people lead such chaotic lives. Mm -hmm. It's so hard to, for people to make those choices, isn't it? And to, to have the confidence to go out and, you know, change how they are, it's, sure. it's very difficult, isn't it? So I think you do need policy and that to, to come in as well to big business. And it is such a shame that, you know, how dominant they are over things like the Olympics and taking on the agenda setting. So, yeah, it's, it's complex, really complex, isn't it? And it's not an issue, food isn't an issue for an awful lot of people, it should be, but it, it's just it's kind of down there, isn't it? Another question. It's sort of a comment and a question kind of mixed up. I mean, you, you were talking about health being central, really, and I was just thinking about attitudes to food and um, the pressure people are under, the fact that lots of people don't take lunch hours, or they take very short breaks and they eat over their computers and people are rushing around trying to lead, living very busy lives so they feel they don't have time to cook so there's there's this sort of pressure on people to achieve to meet targets to work long hours we work the longest hours in Europe so it's, it's about a cultural change very much about a cultural change and I'm thinking about how do you influence culture in that way but I mean I think also you know, information is really important because um, you know, I work um, at the moment um, with um, people who misuse alcohol and it's, a, it's an educational role. And I'm all, always amazed at what little understanding people have about units of alcohol and about you know, that they're in the culture of drinking heavily and haven't really questioned why they do it. And I think that applies to things. And I think you know, the, the relationship between serious illness and poor diet, I think that really needs to be brought home to people. So it's about changing a culture, but how do you do that to make um, health more central? I'm looking around for a hand, a hand to come up for a, another question. 
Simon at the back. There's a the point that Tim uh, touched on briefly. Um, is we regularly have talking heads on the news, on the radio, on the telly, telling us the economy must grow, economic growth is good. But when you think about it, what that really means is we're just consuming stuff faster, using up resources faster. Uh, and I think that's probably self-evident to most of the people in this room. But most, most people out there don't seem to get that. Um, how, how can we break away from this idea that we must consume stuff faster in order to be not in recession? Start the easy ones. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think you said it with, with very difficulty. Stop yeah, so. But then that's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, don't we notice? I didn't flog our book. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I was on the Sustainable Development Commission, which was also closed down, so I was sacked three times last week. <laughs> 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 yeah, it be great. Um, but it was a great shame because the Sustainable Development Commission was actually a tiny think tank in government, uh, or sorry, not think tank, advisor to government uh, on these sort of things. And we were articulating what our economics commissioner, Tim Jackson, wrote in a, in a, in a book, which was actually a report for us, which you can download from the website, it's called, called Prosperity Without Growth. And essentially that's the problem the 21st century has got. How can we change the model that actually is always said to have come from Adam Smith and the Enlightenment, but didn't actually? They, they felt then very clearly that they understood the limits of nature. They didn't anticipate the architecture of liberal economics. They didn't anticipate the capacity to raid and pillage the environment in the way that we have done so. So I think it's just a political fight, is my honest answer. And things like this, here we are talking about it, you know, that's what we're about, that's what you're doing. You think you're soaring bits off old fruit trees, you're actually reclaiming what a real economy is about, which is, that's growth, actually. What we call growth that I look at through my window at my university is actually capital circulating. Mm -hmm. And there's a difference between the real world of ecosystem growth <coughs> and capital growth. Mm -hmm. And we're actually back. Jeff and I wrote the book. Half of our book is about these issues. You should read it. <laughs> <laughs> From the library. <laughs> I promised I would not say that. Aren't there authors who say, can read that? So I don't think our book is deeply boring. Uh, but it's actually two boring white 60 year old, mid 60 year old, in my case, males thinking about that question. What is a good society? What's a good economy? What's good for health? And it's not what we're doing. And it's going to have to be done. We're going to have to pay the full environmental costs. Meat will be very expensive. Good. Wow, that's unpopular. But actually, what's already happening is the environment is being internalised. Oil is going up. Food is going up. Heating is going up. So actually, the long trajectory of consumerist-based economic growth has already ended, actually. We're now five years into the readjustment. So, it's painful, and we're going to have to explain why it is. Why it is, and why that's inevitable. And how a better life will be maybe be paying more for our food, and less for our houses. And not going to work to buy a car to then try to escape, but join a traffic jam. Because that's what they learned in the 19th century. You can't escape the pollution of the towns. You've got to sort out the pollution of the towns. I think we're exactly at that moment. We've got to sort out the craziness of the economic pollution of our lives. So I'm wildly utopian. <laughs> but actually, late capitalism is showing that's already happening. We're not, it was theoretical ten years ago. We knew this would happen. It's now happening. A long, in my world, I, tell you, I sit on UN bodies that I've been sat. <laughs> 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 I 
all the best like, people. I'm, I'm actually on, I'm an advisor to Boris Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got tickets to the Olympics. <laughs> Yeah, but he's not the best cook. I've never met him. 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 The, I mean, this debate is going on <coughs> at the extraordinary places. Believe it or not, the bank trouble. They're beginning to, within it, they're beginning to see it as necessary. There are arguments going on at every level. It's going on. So, keep asking your question. Why was it tricky? It's about changing how we live our lives. Mm. And Jeff's in my book has a whole thing on the transition. The core of our book is about nine transitions. I never even said that my talk. It's about nine transitions with our shipping our lives. Uh, it's been impaled on those. That's what we've got to rethink. I'm sorry, that was a very long answer. That's yeah, not sure. Sure. No, that's what you were here. I, I don't know if there's no, like panels of a view on economics and sustainability, how what they're doing impacts on that. Well, yeah, I, I chip in. I, I gave a, a talk a couple of years ago to the local philosophy society. It was probably even more boring than Tim's. Well, I made my boring you. Going back to environmental. Yeah, so the thrust of the talk was about the... Uh, Blame Jeff, though. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he, he's the one that Not me. Yeah, it was about... Um, the, the, the talk was entitled The End of Economic Growth, question mark, because, as Tim's saying, all, all of the big dogs, um, uh, uh, if you like, in World Power, World Bank, IMF, they've got a, a dogma deeply embedded, just completely embedded in their articles, 3% never-ending growth, that, that's it. 3% never ending growth as a minimum. That, that's, that's, that's the dogma. And so the, the accountancy is completely separated from social and environmental cost. This financial growth will happen forever, you know, hermetically sealed in its own you know, consuming world. And so, and I think we are now at peak oil. I think part of you, you've been talking about transition in your book. Well, of course, the Food Network was inspired out of the national transition movement. Uh, we started the Food Network out of transition, so we are at this point of transition, and uh, it'll it'll be yin and yang, won't it? There'll be increasing crisis and chaos, and we'll have to try and create opportunity. We will have to create opportunity uh, as as things just slow down and grind. We've got to make the best of it. Yes. Um. I, I hope I can articulate the question because my head is buzzing at the moment. I have, for my sins, worked in, in um, health promotion, um, both in the UK and overseas in, in, in developing countries. And um, what I, um, when you were talking about that incredibly complex systems, you call it systems analysis, you know, you showed that big diagram. Yeah. And I'm, I'm kind of intrigued to know whether, as part of, whether we're moving to a more, um, a greater understanding of the complexity when making decisions. Because my personal experience is that you work on a health problem, like I've been working on malaria recently, and you get into this little box. Mm -hmm. And you're a health person mm -hmm. in a small in social market, you know, in, in a very small little place, mm -hmm. and you work on it, and, and that's complicated enough. And the idea of, of, of um, talking to somebody who may be working in AIDS prevention promotion or, or um, in agriculture or in trade or in, you know, all of these things impact on, on the malaria problem and yet health is um, seen as a, nobody is concerned with health especially in developing countries, it's like what was the problem, you know, don't worry about health, that's a low budget department. But you know, this idea of talking to people, uh, it, it's just so complicated to talk within a department, within, within the Ministry of Health to get an individual talking obesity to somebody talking in some... It, that, to me, starts making my head hurt. <laughs> it's just internal communications became the biggest, the biggest issue working in the health promotion. And it was like, how can we get government departments to talk to each other? And then government departments at central level to talk to government departments at, you know, down the line, and then you get to, 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 to even get to your stage where you're talking to communities. That, that, that is such a complex process. So, 
that, that's why I'm struggling with that. Well, I think you've articulated exactly what we have to do. Mm. I mean, Jeff and I, since I'm representing Jeff here as well, he's a parrot on my shoulder. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of our book, that's exactly what you've just said is what we are here. That actually public health is about getting into sexual collaborations. Mm. I mean, that's the words that are put out endlessly. Mm. But actually, where much harder, that means cracking eggs. Mm. That means being confronting those boxes that you referred to. It means saying it's not good enough you being actually in your silo mm. here to use another metaphor. Because collectively we are the conditions on which health depends. And that is actually about being prepared to accept that your vested interest is vested interest. Mm. But we, we lay out in the book some principles which we think are appropriate. And one is interdisciplinarity in public health. It is no good anymore having disciplines that do not talk to other disciplines. Mm -hmm. It is a function of public health is to integrate. <coughs> and if it's not doing that, it can't deliver public health. Public health department or specialist or whatever, which is not talking to the landscape department, which is not talking to and engaging with the transport department. Mm -hmm. in, on the SDC, uh, one of our most continual frustrations was how the Department of Transport was just away with the ferries. It's just, it would like to put motorways over the whole of the planet, uh, and that is a good transport system. There is no sense that, actually, if cars dominate roads, children don't play outside. And if children don't play outside, they're into internal world. They're into cannon fodder world for the advertising. We don't get our children out into streets playing and reclaim space. <coughs> you can't have a public health system. Because actually, that's what's happened. Now, we reclaimed air with the smokeless fuel and with the Clean Air Acts, going back to the 19th century, 1955. I remember the smog. Mm -hmm. okay, when I came back from India, Clean Air actually, uh, or where we were. Uh, to filth, okay? And I remember it. I couldn't believe smog. God, I'd never seen it. I was eight. I couldn't believe it. I choked. I remember it vividly. No. Talking about it. I couldn't remember it. Uh, but th actually, that was a reclaiming public space. What we're about is reclaiming public space. We're about pushing the boundaries so that collective experience can be enhanced. That's very radical stuff. This is radical mm. stuff, I'm sure you know. But is, is systems analysis a framework? Is that, is that something that... Yes, I mean, for Jeff and I, Bargain, we ended up arguing for ecological thinking rather than systems. That model is lovely. It's a systems thing. It's all mechanistic. Yeah. Everything, you know, it's like clockwork, but much more sophisticated than that. Mm. Why... The thinking can be ecology, going back to Darwin and Haeckel, the man who invented the word. Uh, uh, <coughs> there, there are many thinkers and people who've articulated that. We will write it in the book. Read the book. I think you're going to bring it here and sell it to you. Uh, no, you're going to cheap on Amazon. That's really expensive. Is it? Oh I think so. They're not discounted. <laughs> so well, they were. It was. was it? So, yeah, obviously. Well, I don't want to think about it. Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's why I put that. Order it from the library. I was going to do that. Borrow it. Don't buy it. <laughs> Ecology is about, I mean, Darwin, we use Darwin's metaphor in the book, The Entangled Bank. Has anyone read Origin of Species? Or? It's fabulous. You should read it. It's absolutely beautiful. And, you know, it's just wonderful. But there's a bit of poetry, really, where he describes, he suddenly is getting it. But he sees that life is this entangled bank. You know, he's living in Splendor and Down House, by the way. You know, very beautiful. Uh, and, and he looks at a tangled bank, and there, you can get photos of what it did look like. Mm -hmm. This is the integration of things in the soil, the minerals, through to, and he suddenly gets it. That this is all one web of life. Okay. What he didn't get was people. Oh. He didn't get people within it and on it. And that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with extending the metaphor of ecology beyond the Darwinian, Hegelian, the Russell analysis. And that's why a core argument in our book 
is that we've got to reclaim ecology, not allow it to just be seen as social issues mm -hmm. or just biological issues. Mm -hmm. There are some ecologists who say it's all just about biology. Mm -hmm. Not true. Mm -hmm. You cannot understand the 21st century if we don't grasp that central, very simple gra graphic which mm -hmm. I did. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely it. If you don't grasp it, humans are the main drivers of ecosystems. Mm -hmm. We are the drivers of biodiversity loss. We are the drivers of absolutely everything. Mm -hmm. It's all three with the entangled bank. Mm -hmm. That's what public health has got to be about. And that's why we ended up just saying, we have to actually just back But you know, it's health. not just public health. No, no it's not. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's about progress. Yes, we're talking about progress. Yeah. Talking about progress, if I can sort of stop. Dive in and <laughs> <laughs> try to, it's too polite. to, to roll his ahead. Um, because I, I want to ask the panel a question now, and I really want to sort of localise it, and I want to make it forward-looking. Um, and then we may have one or two at the end, but you know, we, we've said tonight that... You're going to get rid of me, by the way, onto a train, so then you can probably just get that. Uh, <laughs> we, we want to get people to sign up as food champions. We're, we're, we're putting together this food network of, of all sorts of you know, different sort of institutions and people and, and small enterprises. Um, we're even talking about a Swindon food plan, um, so there's a lot of ideas, but what I want to ask the panel, and I'll, I'll ask Tim first to give the other panel members time to think about it as well, um, is, is in doing that, you know, what's your advice? What should we have in it? You know, what should we be doing? What's essential to having a network of food champions and a network of enterprises? You know, and what do we need in the food plan? So what, what should we be doing in Swindon over the next year or two? To, well, I'm to a boring this? academic and I would say this, but I, I, this is what I cut my teeth on 35 years ago. This is where, That's why you're going first. This is, <laughs> this is not new. Okay? The first thing I would say is look at what others do. Look at what others have done. There is actually now one of my colleagues in we work, I'm at City University, we work very closely with other academics. We're collaboration. Okay, we're not collaborators, we're in the nasty sense. We like working with others. Mates of ours at Cardiff University are actually doing a project looking at health, uh, looking at food cities. Okay? Get, write me an email and I'll give you their names and addresses. Okay? So learn from others. Secondly, there is a fantastic experience building up internationally. Way the best, I think, is Vancouver. Go and look at Vancouver in British Columbia, of a rich western city. Okay. But it's a fantastic plan and process. You need to get organized, thirdly. You need to organize and bed down with the local authority across different disciplines, across different partnerships. Again, I think Vancouver is very good, but arguably one of the best ever was the pioneer of it which was Toronto, but they said they were actually echoing what we did in London under Ken Livingston with the London Food Commission, which was closed by Mrs. Thatcher. So I have a very, never invite me on anything. So I think there are some very clear things that you can do. Don't just go off like a Catherine wheel, do your homework. Mm -hmm. Seriously do your homework, because that is actually this rich experience. Mm -hmm. Finally, I would say, link into someone like Sustain in mm -hmm. London, the NGO Alliance, mm -hmm. because they're a really pooling of experience on this. But you need to talk to Cardiff and that. But send me an email and I'll give you those. Well, well, Jerry's going to be leading on that, so. Okay, Jerry's sending me an email. Lorraine, what, what, what do you think we should. Um, I think one of the big challenges with many of these things, and it's come up a couple of times tonight, and I've, um, I want to reiterate it, is, is actually getting people to work together. Um, mm. There are uh, so many. Uh, we, we seem to have we seem to have come to a place in our society where there's lots of little pockets, and there's lots of little pockets of, of good stuff, and and lots of people who are looking at this and not, you know, like you were saying with the malaria research, not realising that this is, this is a piece of this whole planet that we're living on. And um, the food projects that have happened in the past have been frustrating for me as a, as a food producer um, because they have not 
hung together all the other little different bits and pieces that are going on. Um, and it's one of the reasons we started the food hub was because you've got a van going to this house with vegetables, you've got another van going with milk, you've got another van going with something else, and another van from Tesco's, and, and it was six vans going to one house, this is Barking Mad. So what we started to look at was being able to bring those things together. Um, and we have a, 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 you know, a good number of local producers who deliver to us and we deliver to the houses. So, I mean, whatever, how, I know, I'm not sure how you do it because I really hear that I'm you know, stating something that's simple but not necessarily easy. Mm -hmm. But it's actually getting, it, getting people to work together and recognising that the farmer's market doesn't operate in isolation. The, the project of Food Champions doesn't operate in isolation. My delivery service doesn't operate in isolation. It's, it's all part of the whole thing. So. Mm -hmm. Can I just say, on a looking forward thing, wouldn't it be great if, as new people, people that haven't come across any of these little pockets before, as soon as they find one, they get ding, 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 and they suddenly know about everything that's going on in Swindon, because that's, there are a core of people who are trying hard to find out all of this, there are another whole load of people who go to Tesco's or get it delivered every single week. And wouldn't it be great if even one of those finds one of us and all of us? And that's, I think, key. Because they're, oh, oh, and oh, get milk as well. Oh, how much is that then? You know, and it's kind of, it, it, you need that instant. People haven't got the time, as you know, Sarah was saying. So that, that's where the network and the online register comes in. Definitely, but, 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 but just networking is going similar vibe and has a similar sustainable thread through it. For, I, I just think of my sister all the time. She's just so mainstream. Think about, you know, I think about me and I think, would I do that? And then she could be bothered. She had an angle hole veg box for a while, then that filled out, you know. And, and so I, I always look at her as my woman on the street kind of thing. Would, could she bother? She's really, she works for a child. You know, I think of her, but I know she's concerned about her health, and everyone is. So. And people with children are often very extra concerned. They won't all eat organic, but they'll feed their babies organic. So that's another inroad, I think, for, for finding those new mums, new parents, those kinds of groups, for instance, is, is another inroad where people suddenly start going, actually, I don't want to give my kid chicken nuggets, you know, because of Jamie Oliver or whatever. But I'm just saying, if you, want, if you recruit someone new to any of these things, it would be great if they somehow, through Facebook and Twitter and all things that are good on the internet, they could know about all of it in Swindon because it's you know it's not a it's not a big it's a big town but it's not a big town in terms of these kinds of things that are going on. So that's something we've definitely got to do. Jerry, Jerry, I'm your well, just just for tonight, I suppose it would be the same as request that anyone who's interested in going into the web-based food directory, um, uh, buttonhole live, we begin to. <laughs> before you go, because we, I think we do, do think we might be able to motivate each other just by simply knowing there and they being able to email these days. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, I think it's as simple and as complicated as that. Just, just get a, the directory moving and let's make it live and let's get contact going. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, like you're saying, just learn from, there's so many good things out there, aren't there, that we can yeah. learn from really good models of how things work and just network and. Sure. Is there a way of actually trying to harness um, those people who would like to make a difference but aren't engaged at the moment? Is there a way collectively that, uh, as, as, um, somebody said to me the other day from the volunteer centre in Swindon that last year they had over 2,000 people contacted them or walked in the door of the volunteer centre wanting to do something. But very few organisations, they struggle to get organisations to register opportunities. So there are people in Swindon who, who want to do things. So how collectively with social media and everything else do we harness those people across the town who really want to make a difference to public health in Swindon? That's a question. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd like to give Ed a chance. Uh, he's been waving at me for a while. <laughs> Just bring yeah. back to the, the last question. Right, well, you asked the sort of thing that I was going to ask, but can I just follow up? <coughs> With local food, is price an issue compared to supermarket prices? If so, why? And what can be done to uh, make it less of an issue? Four minutes to crack that one. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this is an incentive for me to be short. Um, well, prices are going up. Let's get 
real. We've had 140 years of prices going down, except for three blips. One was in World War I, one was in World War II, and one was the world crisis of 1971-74, and now. So this is the fourth. We're now in it. Uh, I led a report for the STC. I inherited it, but I led it and uh, published it as a commissioner, which was set up when oil was 40 dollars a barrel and was published the week it went to $100. And the report was set up to explore what would happen to British food prices if oil did get to $100. Mm -hmm. uh, the Commission and lots of people said, when we came up with a study, it said it would go up 5 to 10 percent. This was absurd. It must go up 50 percent. It's gone up 5 to 10 percent. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what it's done. But we're now in a world where oil is $125. And the analysts are talking about $200. Okay. So I think there is an upward drift. And if it's not oil, it's water. And if it's not water, it's land. And if it's not that, it's population. So the squeeze, the ecosystems are being squeezed. So one, we are in a world of rising food prices. Two, this is altering, the, the politics of this is the altering of consumer expectations. That is the issue. The issue is we've factored in that culture is based upon ever cheaper food delivered by Tesco or whoever. Those days are over. And now we're already seeing, the grocery world is seeing it. They're seeing changes in people, how people shop. The, the retailers are responding by creating local shops. That's their desperate attempt. We see the end of hypermarkets. The end of hypermarkets. This is a very interesting world. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, any, any other Tesco is places. still thirty percent. It can go local. It can go local, and it is do, and it will do. Well, it was interesting on the Apple Day because we have people coming up with apples for free, and there are projects that are about, you know, harvesting fruit that's currently go going to waste. But I'm president of Garden Organic, which is the gardening organisation. Uh, the director of it, Miles Brenner. Uh, inspired by me rabbiting on once about I want people to steal apples. Okay. Mm -hmm. He went and did an audit in his village. And to cut a long story short, four years on now, they have an annual apple day where they collect four tons <laughs> of apples and make it into local cider. And it's become a community <laughs> pleasure zone. It's a public health act of pleasure. <laughs> and what the problem with public health is it's seen as Boring. You said nanny state. Actually, I think nannies are really good people. <laughs> when they're called parents, everyone loves them. But because the, the right wing said nanny state is something that's bad, actually they're bloody good things. Let me want more nannies, actually. They're called parents. People who look after us. People who set the frameworks for us. So I think this juggling, you won't be, so I'm not getting at you, the, the nanny state. Well, we've got to reclaim the state to actually be about pleasure. In, in terms of cost, I want to give the rain the final word. Who is a local producer of, of local operating in a real market? I, I, I have to say that I'm, I'm somewhat fed up with having to continually defend my prices. Yeah, good for you. Um, and go I, on the attack. And I, <laughs> go on the attack. I'm, I'm, I would like... Uh, any, uh, to invite anybody um, who wants to come along um, and spend a year farming with me mm -hmm. and figuring out what really goes on mm -hmm. to producing the meat at the quality mm -hmm. and in the way that I do, I'd like you to come and do it with me. The farm is currently financially struggling. Um, we are not charging enough for our meat. Um, and uh, I don't know whether we'll be in business this time next year. We'll find out. Um, I stand... Uh, up for other local producers who uh, are in my food hub who have the similar problems. And the reason it is more expensive is because it is small. We do not have the economies of scale. We, um, I keep my uh, beef animals, for example, for twice as long as uh, supermarket meat is kept, twice as long as most organic farms keep their meat, to be honest. Um, and when you keep an animal or when you grow a crop more slowly, um, it, it's not rocket science, you know, it takes a longer time, it's going, to cost, it's going to cost more. It costs more in labour, it costs more in purely, da 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 da. So, I... But am, what's the cultural rule? 
I'm going to have to say this and then go, or else I'll be on the Swindon station. The cultural rule life is, has to be something like really good quality exceptionally. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. And I, and I feast day foods on feast days, mm -hmm. not Definitely. every day. As, as half of them are about to run out the door, before I wind up, I just want to take the opportunity to, to thank you.